Hello everyone, this is Ray Stendhal, publisher of Customer Engagement Magazine, and I'm so happy that you're with us in this very important series that we're putting together on the subject of self-reliance. Today I have as my guest one of my good friends and an expert on this subject matter. He is the author of 16 books, two of which are international bestsellers, which are Relationship Selling and The Acorn Principle. He has given over 3,000 talks and is also the recipient of multiple awards in the public speaking industry. My guest is no other than the one, the only, Mr. Jim Cathcart. Welcome to the hey. program. Yeah, thank you, Ray. This is <laughs> exciting. I'm looking forward to this. So this is a talk, everybody, that Jim and I have been talking about now for a few months, and we've been uh, discussing this subject, and we think it is absolutely vitally important that you take a look at what we have to talk about today and see how you can apply it in your own life and in your own business. And um, you know, before we get started, Jim, I just want to throw this over to you and just say a few words about some of the work that you have been doing and kind of give a little bit of context for those that may not know a lot about you. Well, I've been a professional speaker since 1977, and I've done, as you mentioned, about 3,000 presentations all over the world. I've been the president of the National Speakers Association, but I started out as a, a government clerk, overweight, out of shape guy in Little Rock, Arkansas, with no college degree and no money in the bank. And I heard Earl Nightingale on the radio and got inspired. Earl had a program called Our Changing World and it was a motivational radio show that was about five minutes long and I heard it one day and it inspired me to change my own life because I never expected to do much in the world I never expected to matter I figured I'd have a decent life I'd be a good person a nice guy a, a good neighbor you know but I didn't I didn't expect to make my mark in the world and what Earl said that day was if you'll spend an extra hour each day studying your chosen field five years later you'll be a national expert in that field and I thought wow you know that formula actually works and it doesn't require me to be a gifted prodigy in order to work it wow I don't have to have a PhD going in I don't have to hmm an hour a day I got you know I can do that and so I committed myself to five years of fanatical dedication to learning about the field of personal development which was what I wanted to get into and five years later I was a full-time professional speaker and author flying around the country and giving speeches today I've been the president of the National Speakers Association served on the board of the International Federation which is called the Global Speakers Federation I've um, gad, you know I've, I've done things so far beyond my dreams I even got to know Earl Nightingale himself for a while I was selling his recorded materials and years later he was selling mine and when he passed away, I was the only outside speaker at his memorial service in addition to his widow, Diana, and a video clip from Dennis Waitley, one of his authors. So I went from, you know, being basically a nobody to being, at least in my field, a somebody. And I know that I did it by following the right formulas and developing the right mindset. And I know that everyone is capable of that in their own context in some way because it doesn't require you know huge intellectual brilliance or a lot of financial supporters or something like that or special circumstances you don't have to be a white guy in a suit you, you know you can be of whatever racial background or cultural background you want you know you look at people in every context there have always been people that have come out of that ugly mess and made something of themselves so those are the people that I aspire to be like and I want to show other people the way to follow those examples be the exception to the rule be the person who stands out takes the lead and makes a difference in the world thank you for that Jim and what I love about your story is that it is the is a great case study actually for what we're going to be talking about today because today we have created a, a blueprint that we're going to share with you through this video that's going to help you become a more self-reliant individual to contribute within your own family and also within your own business but before we jump into that let's talk about 
what does it really mean to be self-reliant and what is it? So, Jim, why don't you throw in a few thoughts on that and I, I, I can add in some as well. And then we can talk about how self-reliance has changed because the subject of our interview and the magazine is the rise and fall of self-reliance in America. And quite frankly, I would extend that to the rest of the world in many ways. So let's talk about defining the subject, Jim. You bet. Self-reliance means that when the challenges come, I don't have to find somebody else to rescue me. I can handle it, right? So it means that I'm self-reliant on many, many, many levels. That I can handle my own finances. I can handle my own health. I can handle my own education. I can determine how I want to want my life to be and change it from what it has been into what I'd like it to be. Uh, the trouble is so much of the world encourages us to be reliant, dependent upon somebody else or some other thing, especially government or especially, you know, like the educational institutions or dependent on, you know, some savior somewhere to swoop in and rescue us from ourselves. But what you find as you study these people that have been, become the exceptional achievers across all categories is they didn't do it because somebody else gave them a hand up. I mean, they may have found lots of assistance along the way, lots of mentors and helpers and guides. There may have been some special opportunities. But in almost every case, the dominant characteristic they had was the willingness and commitment to say, if it is to be, it's up to me. I'm going to make this happen. If I have to stay up nights and study, if I have to work harder than the average person, if I have to give up some of my privileges and, and, and uh, enjoyments in order to get this job done, I'm going to do it and take whatever time and effort it takes to get it done. Now, is there a limit to what you could commit to like that? Of course. Some things would be an outrageously big or wrong goal. But for what you genuinely want, what you truly dream about, you need to be the one who decides, I'm going to make it happen. To add to what you're saying, I would add that it's, it's about having accountability and responsibility in your own life, for your life, and being willing to work diligently to realize the goals that you set for yourself. And as we're discussing this, we believe that there is a shift between the way individuals conducted themselves in time past, which we'll get into, and the way things are happening in today's society and in today's culture. And maybe that's a good leeway to talk about what did self-reliance really mean when the country was formed. And I'll start with some of the basics. And Jim, you can add to it. Well, and by the way, let me add in something before you start into, into that. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing self-reliance is absolutely not is blaming. It's not about accusing your circumstances. It's not about accusing another person. It's not about saying, well, you know, if only, if only I had two arms and two feet. I know successful, wealthy people who were born without arms and feet. It's, it's not about saying, well, yeah, you know, look at you. You're, you're an articulate adult. Well, I know people that started out as very non-articulate adults and became articulate. You know, you can overcome almost anything if you decide to do it. But it, the commitment has to start with you. Back to you, Ray. Oh, oh no, I, I agree with what you're saying. You know, and something else that just jumped in my mind is that s sometimes I, I hear the uh, expression, well, you started off with all these extra privileges or all these extra opportunities or you had a great family and a great education and a great this and a great that. And in some cases, one must be obviously very grateful for the good things that have been in their lives. But at the end of the day, there are many people who start off with great things and don't leverage them and use them to make something of themselves. And they end up dying in the ditch as a drug addict or something equivalent along those lines. And they're not using what they had. And then there's other people who came to the country with nothing, or were born here with nothing, and were able to accomplish so much. So a lot of what we're talking about here today is not just about what you started with, but it's really what you choose to make of yourself based on what you have available. Exactly. You can look at an example like Helen Keller, you know, a woman who couldn't speak, 
couldn't hear and couldn't see. Well, good heavens, that's a formula for complete disaster. And yet, she was able to become a substantial person and really make a difference in the world. You look at, at people like Glenn Cunningham, who, you know, stories from way in our past, but Glenn Cunningham suffered severe burns and they were thinking about sawing off his legs, amputating his legs because of the burns, and yet, through discipline, iron will discipline that he developed over time, he not only got back to normal health, he became an Olympic runner. And he, and he ran, the, he broke the four-minute mile barrier. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there, there's example after example. I mean, a recent book about Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini was captured in World War II. He survived 40-some-odd days in the Pacific in a life raft, you know, just catching whatever food he could. And then he was captured by the Japanese and imprisoned and beaten and tortured for years on end, and then finally came back to the United States, and today is a, a well-adjusted, healthy man. Oh my gosh, how is that possible? So when you look at you know whatever it is you personally have been whining about, and I whine about things from time to time, just like everybody else, just ask yourself, hey, what about the guy that was born blind, or what about the one who has no arms or what about you know what about the person who was abused throughout their childhood or what about the one that was born into abject poverty and they made it what are you whining about you know <laughs> <laughs> to, to that point just let's look at the circumstances we are in right now right now we are both communicating through technology in front of a computer we're living in an age when people are watching us at this very moment creating a video which could never have been possible just a short period ago and yeah, yeah. compare that to somebody who doesn't have any food or any water and is living in a little hut somewhere on the other end of the world. How, how many advantages we have in front of us to be able to take us to the next level? Precisely. Right. So, so let's when, not... when our founding fathers came here, why did they come here? To escape oppression. Because they couldn't be self-reliant where they were living. They needed a place where they could be free to make their own way, pay their own dues, suffer their own, you know, consequences of bad choices, but to be free from oppressive, overbearing control from outside of themselves. Absolutely, and that, that's actually one of my favorite words in the whole English language is freedom, and yeah. what freedom really means in terms of a free society, free will, the ability to exist and grow and develop as you want to without harming harming others in the process. Freedom and of choice, freedom of thought. Freedom of beliefs, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what this country was is, is really based on. And if we start to go back and think about what did self-reliance really mean back when the country was formed, and we go back to the basics of food. You had to go and hunt for your food. You had to farm your food. You had to be in charge of your own nutritional plan. Otherwise, you weren't going to eat. Right? Yeah, and you didn't just eat for today or hunt for today. Because right, if you yeah. did that on a day when you couldn't hunt or couldn't find anything, you'd have starved. So just you had to plan as well as act for now. Just a few generations ago, that it was common practice in a family to know how to can your food and store it for a day in which you don't have food. Now, that's a lost art. No one knows how to, most people don't know how to can food, how to preserve food. Um, when we think about shelter, back yeah. then you had to go about creating your shelter. There wasn't a, a development you can just move into and pay some rent to somebody. Yeah, yeah, you built your own house. And you took a lot of pride in that. You know, and, and people would join together in communities and help each other out on the big part, like a, a barn raising or something like that, you know, where it was heavy lifting that required a lot of people. Then the neighbors would pitch in. And see, that's the thing. When people are self-reliant as opposed to dependent on the other people, then others are more willing to help. Because if you're self if I get it that you're okay without me, I'm happy to pitch in because I know you're not going to turn around and become a, a, a unexpected dependent mm -hmm. and be on my doorstep every other week saying, hey, Jim, could I have another handout? Hey, mm -hmm. Jim, could you help me do such and such? Hey, can I borrow those tools once again? No, Ray. I loaned you the tools the first time. It's your job to get the tools that you need ongoing. 
Yes, very, very true. You know, some of you who are watching this might be, why are Ray and Jim talking about what life was like back when this country was formed? You're going to see this very clearly because we're in a society which is far different than what life was like back then. And some of that is positive, but some of that is also negative, which we're going to get into. Hey, how about communications, Jim? What was life like back when we started the country from a communication standpoint? Well, if you couldn't walk over to where the person was or ride your horse over there, you pretty much were stuck. Right? Right. And, and if you didn't know how to read and write, which many people didn't, mm -hmm. then your communication ability was restricted to the face-to-face -face circumstances you could create. So within a community, the people that could read and write had to teach the other people to read and write so that everyone got the ability to be independent. So some people, you know, they look at the ability to read and write as, oh, yeah, that's something that, that people ought to do. No. It's something that if people don't do it, they rely on, become dependent on others for their communication. So we need to learn to be good communicators, and we need to acquire the tools like you and I have right here in this technology to communicate with other people when, when we're not physically there. See, that's, it, it, the reason for talking about the founding of our country is the same basic underlying steps towards self-reliance are absolutely essential in every life on earth. If you want to become independent, if you want to become free to make your choices, do what you want to do, live your life the way you choose to live it, then you need to go through some of the same fundamental thought processes and skill development processes that our founding fathers so vividly illustrated in their own breaking free from the, from the oppressors in Europe and around. Very, very well said. And to add to that, we can, we can, we, what you mentioned about communication skills feeds right into thinking about education. How did yeah. people educate their their children? What were the values, the morals, the 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 infrastructure that was put in place to be able to pass on a skill set and knowledge so that they could thrive in their next generations? Yeah, These let's think about that for a second. If you're teaching kids and you're in a, a survival uh, community like they were back in, in Plymouth Rock, you know. Um, what do the kids need to know so that the kids don't become, de don't remain dependent on the adults? And by the way, kids at that time, by the time they were old enough to walk and talk, they had jobs to do. I mean, they didn't have little token chores. They had jobs that others depended on them at mm -hmm. an early age. You can say, oh, that's child slavery. Well, no, everybody was enslaved to themselves and each other just to stay alive. You know, so what do you teach kids? Well, first off, you teach them fundamental skills. How do you not do harm? You know, how do you not set the house on fire? How do you not let the cow go? You know, <laughs> how, do you, how do you not spoil the crops? How do you not whatever? How do you not uh, ruin the resources we need to protect ourselves from the elements or whatever? So that's number one. Next thing, you teach them how to, how to feed themselves, you know, what to eat and what not to eat, what's dangerous or poisonous and what, what's just fine. Uh, the next thing you teach them is you teach them how to do work. You teach them the use of tools. Then you teach them how to relate to other people so that they don't alienate other people and they get their cooperation. And then you teach progressively each new thing. You teach them words. You teach them meanings. You teach them um, mathematics, you know, the basics of this plus this equals that and will never equal more than that. You know, so they understand how to calculate how much do we have and how much will we need and how long will it be and so forth. So you teach the thinking that causes the person to become self-reliant. Now, hundreds of millions of people have preceded us on Earth, okay? Many of them were wise, wise, wonderful people who contributed to the knowledge, the wisdom, the collective wisdom of humanity. And that wisdom gets passed along, or at least it did for many generations. And it was passed along through stories and through parents teaching children and elders teaching youngers. Okay? That was the norm in every community in the primitive and the advanced societies. What's happened is that television has become the teacher of default. The schools have been teaching, uh, we've been assuming that the schools were teaching the skills kids needed when in fact the schools had gone off in a, in a very less productive direction teaching many things 
you know, like honoring diversity. Well, nice idea, but for heaven's sakes, first teach me how to stay alive, right? Okay, so the, the schools aren't providing all of the education that helps us get to the point of self-reliance. What's the end result? The end result is people are dependent. And when people are dependent, someone else is in control. When someone else is in control, you are by fact a victim of whatever they do. Very well said. And we think about today's school system, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how the world is today and how we can start to rectify some of these challenges. We do not have a school system today that delivers on the skill set that will produce self-reliant, productive individuals. And, and then, that's, you know, Pardon me for interrupting, Ray, but I've, I've got a friend from long, long ago, back in the 1970s, Rick Little, not to be confused with the comedian Rich Little. Rick mm -hmm. Little, when he was a teenager, founded an organization called Quest, and he got together with a lot of educators and leaders in the world of in the field of education and had the people co-author a textbook called Skills for Living. And then Rick went around the country and met with directors of, uh, you know, superintendents of schools and directors of education and met with uh, political leaders, even first ladies and, and people like that, you know, in the White House and got endorsement for his program to teach in public school systems basic skills for living, such as how do you manage money? How do you manage a checkbook? Well, a lot of schools don't even approach that subject. How do you set goals in life? How do you keep yourself healthy and, and well nourished? You know, not just PE, not, not just that, but how do you keep yourself healthy? How do you get along with people you don't yet know? And how do you get along with people you already know, but maybe you have conflict with them? How do you work out, how do you do problem solving? Identify the need, you know, et cetera. There are steps in problem solving that are learnable. How do you develop the kind of critical thinking that allows you to deal with the real problem and not just address symptoms that may be the apparent problem? So Rick did that, and that's, it's accepted in a lot of school systems, but not most. Mm -hmm. And I think something like that needs to take place in every household and every school system. First teach us what we need to get by then teach us the higher level thinking things and the you know the, the the cultural things like I was mentioning honoring diversity that sort of thing that type of training would be so valuable if it would be put into our school system so that youngsters growing up would get that as part of their upbringing in a systematic and in a organized manner and then adding to what you have mentioned relative to teaching them how to get by, how to first of all get by higher level thinking aboard on top of that then you start to think about when we look at the the root of productivity and growth within an economy we start thinking about small businesses we think about entrepreneurship we think about the basics of marketing and sales and how to connect with others in a way that delivers value in the marketplace and it still boggles my mind how when we, if you ask anybody what's driving the economy, it's small business, and then you ask the question, what are we doing to create more entrepreneurs in our school system? How do we, do we produce more entrepreneurs, not how do we produce more people who can follow the rules and play a, a smaller role in society? And there's a, there's a difference between what we want to produce and what is actually being done, and that, I think, is also a big part of our conversation. being said, Jim, let's talk about the world today and let's just highlight a little bit of some of the issues that are is vastly different from the, what the world was like when the country was founded. We have yeah. millions and even when, when I was growing up, you know, I'm, I'm currently in my 60s and when I was growing up in the late 1940s, the 1950s and 60s, you know, the things I was taught, the things I was learning not only at school but also at home were quite different from what people are getting today. 
and what was expected from our neighbors and in our, our communities was different then. You know, that, uh, the, for example, I mean, here's one thing that's a, a bit controversial today, but when I was growing up, it was no big deal at all. I would, at age uh, probably six through 15, in my bedroom at home, my dad was a telephone repairman, my mom was a housewife, I had a little sister, and my grandfather was an invalid from a stroke, and he and my grandmother lived in our front bedroom. This was in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I grew up with a cabinet above my bed that contained shotguns, rifles, handguns, and hunting knives, plus ammunition. It had a lock on it, but the lock was not closed. So in other words, I had an arsenal of firearms and weapons in my room at my disposal, should I choose to make a bad choice, uh, throughout my entire youth when I was old enough to do harm. Never once, not one time in my entire childhood did I play with the guns, ever. I was taught from as early as I can remember to respect weapons, to treat them in an appropriate way, to rely on my dad to guide me until I learned how to use a weapon and, and whether and when to use a weapon and how to care for one and so forth. And I never, happily, never found the need to use a weapon in personal defense. And uh, so thank God for that. But I learned to use weapons. And if you go up and down my street when I was a kid, all the other homes had firearms in them and ammunition. It was not like, you know, guns cause crime. No, they don't. Guns just change the nature of the crime. You know, criminals cause crime. Well, circumstances cause criminals. No, because there are also people in those same circumstances who don't go into crime. It's personal choice. And what I'm exhorting our listeners and viewers to do is make the personal choice, make the commitment to become self-reliant, to be the exception to the herd that's charging off the cliff, and to take responsibility first for yourself, and then for your family, and then for your business, and then for your community, and then for your world. It's so easy to listen to you, Jim. It's like I, it resonates to the fiber of my being, what you're saying. I, and it also got me thinking a little bit about... Uh, my story here, you know, similar to you, uh, I, I grew up with, with guns as well. And um, and I, I know my dad will be eventually watching this video, and I, I just say this, is that when I grew up with, with guns, we had a simple rule. The rule was this, is that any time I wanted to go out with my dad and shoot the gun in a safe environment with all the appropriate precautions, mm -hmm. we could. And yes. I knew where the guns were, I knew where the ammunition was, and... Um, and, and the point here is is that I never once ventured out on my own to touch it, even though I very well could, yeah. because there was an alignment of trust between my dad and myself relative to that. And, you know, in the same way that you, you talked about it, while I had everything at my disposal, I, and it, it came down to personal choice, and the point is is that in today's world, we view on this topic of guns, incidentally, that it is the... Uh, the cause of many bad things in, in, in the world and many statistics are cited but the reality is you can kill more people with a car than you can with a gun and we let people who are 16 years old drive cars and it's... Well plus if, we, if we're going to try and control weapons we're going to have to control clubs we're going to have to control knives, forks we're going to have to control ballpoint pens in the hands of the wrong person you know we're going to have to control Pillows as a suffocation instrument. I mean, there's, you can't control weapons. At the end of the day, these two fists can kill somebody. Yeah. There and you it go. Down, it's not about weapons. It's about personal choice and holding people there accountable. See, my so, grandson is currently 13 years old, and last week my wife and I went to his final testing and uh, awarding of his black belt in Taekwondo. Well, my little 13-year-old grandson can kick my ass, but he wouldn't, thank God. Uh, but, you know, that, that's the whole point. I mean, he has learned to use his body as a weapon if need be, 
But more importantly, in going through the Taekwondo training, he has learned the discipline, the respect for his elders, the respect of the process, the knowledge of knowing the limits of what to do and what not to do, and and he also recites every time they go to one of their, their trainings, he recites this creed that talks about honor and respect and duty and you know that sort of thing. None of it's about war, none of it's about hurting, none of it's about harm. It's all about being a, a, you know, an honorable individual. And that's the whole point. That's what we've got to get back to. It's like religion. You know, people have issues all around religion, and, and many justifiably so. But the point of religion, the reason it exists in a culture of human beings, is that those who have figured out an effective way of understanding the world and their part within it get together with other people of similar understanding, so similar beliefs, and they find ways to practice those beliefs. And in a, in a religion that's healthy and, and promotes life as opposed to that's angry and, and takes life, uh, in, a, in a healthy religion, all of the basic religions of the world, the healthy religions, have those things in common. You know, that they see that there is a greater good than themselves. There's a reason to be good besides just the selfish level reasoning on that. There's a reason to help, to make a difference, to contribute. Um, and there are other people that you can connect with that nurture that. So that's, you know, that's why we need the effect that, that is uh, created in religion and government in our society. You know, of course, any time a group of people get together, somebody's got to be in charge first. But even though the father is traditionally in charge of the family, the wife and the kids get a vote. They get input, you know. And if they don't, then the father's a tyrant, and, of course, the family grows up like a bunch of cowed, beaten people. But in a, in a healthy family, everybody gets to talk, and somebody who, who's typically the most enlightened of the bunch makes the final decision and then the rest of them follow that commitment so that's the way our government ought to work the people are in charge not the governing uh, well, it, uh, politician it, it, it comes back to the idea it's a government by the people for the people that's where a republic is and that's where the, yeah. that's what government was about back when the country was founded it's and government public too. servants right the whole idea of public servants makes me smile they work for the people right? That, right that's who they're supposed to be accountable to so that being said jim let's jump into the next part of this as we as we key things up for our blueprint and talk about okay. the world today you know we've talked about the world in the past let's talk about the world today and i'll, I'll throw out the first comment that that i see and that is when we talk about dependency versus being self-reliant there are millions of people today who either work for the government or de dependent on the government in one shape, way, or another. And the interesting statistic I've seen is approximately one-third, about 100 million people today, generate an income through their work and pay taxes into a system. And the remaining people in the United States, at least, uh, some of which have certainly contributed a lot to society and have earned their 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 position to retire and have put money into the system. I mean, I'm not no, uh, negating yeah, that. But I'm just saying yeah. there's about 100 million people who are supporting 313 million total people, including themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really a big challenge. Well, yeah, because when you look at it historically, the ratio has been vastly different. It was, you know, a small percentage of the people in the government, say, you know, l let's use a number just to illustrate it, 20 percent. And 80 percent of the people were the productive part of society that is creating products, creating resources, providing services, and, and feeding the economy itself. So any, gov any uh, entity that is primarily uh, government employees, that means private enterprise is squeezed out and everybody is dependent on the people making the policies and the rules and those are the ones that determine your future not you so if I start a lemonade stand and I don't have the government license to have a lemonade stand then I end up no longer able to sell lemonade wow and if you're the guy who's growing lemons I'm no longer a customer of yours and if I'm the guy who's selling fertilizer to the lemon grower, 
then I've no longer got a customer because you're in trouble. And then, you know, and it goes all the way back to wherever it starts. Part of my interruption here, but let me just, let's take what you just said and, and take it to the full completion. You're the lemonade stand owner, and you're not able to sell lemons, and everybody up that value chain is impacted. Now, when it comes time to feed your family, and you can't perform this function of selling lemonade, now we enter this realm of dependence. And That's right. now, how are you going to get by when your stomach is rumbling? Yeah. You're going to have a challenge. You know what some people would say? They'd say, well, hey, just have the government on the lemonade stands. Yeah, right, like that's going to happen. Okay, and, and it could happen, but, but the government, if it owns the business, its goal is not the same as an individual who owns a business. You know, the government's role, the government's goal in a business is to sustain the business. That's it. But you know, an individual's right. goal is to grow the business. And where it also gets kind of interesting and perhaps a little controversial is then you end up having a, a, a lemonade stand owner who says, you know, maybe what I need to do is work with government to create some public policies that can benefit the lemonade stand industry. And lo and behold, the government has now become a partner in the lemonade stand business, which hurts perhaps other lemonade stands which are not involved in the same level of involvement. Well, plus, yeah, I might find that my local customer base doesn't like lemonade, but they love orange juice. And so I make a deal with you to provide oranges, you know, and I start right. making orange juice, and then the government comes back and says, hey, you can't do that. Why? Because all the people are coming to you for orange juice, you've got a monopoly. Monopoly's not fair. So we'll let other people come up with their own orange juice. No, 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 no. You've got to share your technology. You've got to, you know, and then all of a sudden... Decisions that would have been made based on what's going to work and what's not are now made based on what's fair and what's not. Now, fairness is a concept that makes everything go the wrong direction. I'm not saying fairness is a bad idea. I'm you saying have have, fairness is not a good policy. You have to have an objective way of measuring success. And when private industry is punished for being successful, there's a yep. problem. And you know, just to add a little bit more fuel to this interesting fire that we're we're brewing to then show you how we're going to get out of this mess. <laughs> is that when we think about the the world today, I mean, m many of you watching these videos are very well informed and you know that the dollar is international reserve currency that all other currencies peg their value to. And as you know, right now we have um, a monetary system that is expanding through increasing debt, which is just a fancy way of saying we're printing digital money and the impacts of all of this, the very real impacts to you who's watching this video is that the costs of your production is going up because of inflation. That means it's going to be harder for you to generate a profit in the future with this expanding debt. Number two, the, infl the taxation factor and the bureaucracy of doing business is, can, is, I would say, on an upward trend that becomes more difficult to do business. And ultimately, this results in having to do more with less and to do so with less staff. And that's where this big challenge is continuing to erupt because we are not acting as a society in a self-reliant way and we are trying to paper over all of the expenses that we have, which isn't going to last forever. Mm -hmm. You know, every time you put a government in charge of an enterprise, the enterprise becomes, over time, less efficient and one of the classic examples, I remember Rich DeVos, one of the founders of uh, Amway, he told about this in a speech. He said in, in Russia, this was back 20 years ago, he said in Russia they, they started allowing private ownership of farms mm -hmm. and uh, in a few exceptional situations. He said, but the government owned all of them. This was the USSR. This was back in the day, right? Um, the government owned almost everything, but they had allowed, as an experiment, a few farms to have private ownership. And what they found was the productivity coming out of the private farms was like 10 times greater than the productivity coming out of the government farms. And yet it was the same farms that had previously been owned by the government. And they asked why. And then they realized that in the government farms, the farmers at dark would park the tractor and go back to the house. And on the private farms, at dark, the owners, the farmers, would put lights on their tractors and drive it on into the night to get the job done. So they were committed to the outcome, not committed to the process. That's the definition of a bureaucrat. 
someone who is more committed to their process, their procedure, than they are to the effect that it has. You go to a government agency and it's not uncommon to encounter someone that says, you should have been here yesterday, and that's somehow supposed to make you go away. You say, well, you know, I couldn't have gotten here yesterday, so what can I do now? Well, I'm sorry, but, you know, the rule says you should, should have been here yesterday. Yesterday was the deadline. In a government agency, that makes perfect sense. In a private business, you say, okay, I understand. Maybe there's a penalty. Let's, let's make it right. What do I need to do? So in a, in a bureaucracy, it's all about did you complete these steps in this order using these forms? Do you have these stamps and these signatures? Not, is this going to work? And in private enterprise, it's always, is this going to work? If so, then we'll do all these other things. But if it's not going to work, let's, let's just don't do this, right? And you also, you're constantly looking at the ratio of what it takes, your commitment, to what it pays, your payoff, your result. So completely different type of thinking. Now, look at the U.S. today. We have an enormous number, millions of people working for the government, working in government jobs, many of which, tens of thousands, have been proven to be useless jobs, jobs in agencies that no longer have a reason to continue to exist. We also have laws that have no particular reason for existing, and yet they're not reviewed and then discarded or replaced. Okay, So anytime you've got government growing, 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 then you've got to ask, okay, what if it outgrows its usefulness? Well, then you just eliminate it? No. What happens is if you give the government the ability to unionize the government workers, then all of a sudden the government workers can go against their employer, which in this case is you and me, the people. They can actually take legal action against us to get themselves greater benefits, like their pension fund, their privileges, the time off, health care uh, services, and so forth. When that happens, then the government is voting itself through the legal system more and more good circumstances, while you and I as taxpayers are having to come up with more and more money from where? From whatever we're doing for a living in order to facilitate their growth. And the government, when it gets as big as ours is today, starts intruding into people's lives. They say, Ray, I don't like the way you're doing this. You can't do that anymore. We got a new law. You say, well, wait, wait, wait. I didn't vote for that law. Doesn't matter. You put us in charge, and we decided it's a law. And so you start exec you know, executing executive orders and things like that that are outside the process. Oh, my God, how dysfunctional is this whole thing? Hmm. I enjoyed what you said, and it got me thinking. <clears throat> As some of my readers know, uh, my family came from a communist country. And when you talked about the farm in the private sector and the farm in the government sector, it really rang true from some of the stories that I heard about my ancestors and what they went through and the uh, huge, huge, huge penalties they paid for... Um, trying to essentially exist in a, in a happy manner, in a productive manner. I won't go into too much detail on that, but what I also wanted to circle back on is when we talked about earlier on about what self-reliance meant when this country was formed, and was, we're looking back and saying, what does it mean now? Let's just think about it. Food. Today, we, have to, we're, we are completely dependent on a just-in-time food system. If oil Real prices food. go up, which they are, and trucks do not arrive to the supermarket, you're not going to have food to eat be on five days from now. The average person does not have more than five days of food that they can exist on. Yeah. Uh, well, look at, look at fuel, gasoline. How many people have any reserve gasoline at all? They've got what's left in the tank, mm -hmm. and they're dependent on their local service stations to have fuel when they go there. I remember 1974, that dried up for a while. If we, if we take a look at, for example, the education system, we already talked a little bit about this, but in today's education system, you can go all the way through grade school, high school, and college and not know how to balance a checkbook or how to relate to somebody in a sales process, which is fundamental in any business. All right? yeah. um, what, what about the idea of defense? We talked about our stories with guns, and every time something bad happens or somebody takes a bad action, they go after the tool, 
not the, the, the psychotropic drugs that most of these kids are on that commit these crimes. So the point is, is the role of government has changed, the role of education has changed, the idea of how we exist and with food and shelter and defense, everything has changed. And the role of representation has changed, like the legal system. Legal you, know, system. you can sue somebody for almost anything. You can sue somebody for looking at you in a disrespectful manner. Imagine that. Looking right. at you in a disrespectful manner. Right, right. So that being said here, we, we've, been, we've been really beating the drum here, so to speak, because what we are, Jim and I mutually uh, talked before this video, and we want everybody who's watching this to understand that the idea of self-reliance is so core to who we are as people to be able to to be able to have the freedom to pursue your dreams and, and make life better for yourself, for your family. And this video series that we're not going to go into deeper is really for people who are looking to be problem solvers and people who are looking to understand the truth and embrace objective reality to better themselves and the people that they care about. Yeah. And um, People who want Jim, to be free on every level. Yeah. I think we also think that, and we're going to, you're going to see this in our blueprint, we want you watching this video to emerge from this with a new sense of awareness to, to be more confident about who you are and what you can contribute in society, be more competent, and be able to really live your best life. I think that's, that's one of the goals. Jim, anything else you'd like to say in terms of who this video is for and what some of the goals are for them? A good parallel to this is looking at the role of a manager. I look at the role of a manager of people as being to become progressively less necessary. Now, what I mean by that is that if I'm the manager of a group, you know, a team of people, my job is to help them develop the skills of self-reliance that allow them to do their work well and even do it better than I was teaching them to do it without my presence or my involvement. So the more I teach them to become self-reliant, the less they need that level of me. And the more I can progress to something else and bring even greater value. But if I don't teach them to be self-reliant, then I teach them by default to become dependent on me. And everything said, well, you know, we can't do this. Jim's not here. He makes those decisions. I'm sorry, I don't have the authority or the wisdom to make this choice. You're going to have to wait till the boss gets back. So the role of a boss is to become less necessary. The role of a parent is to become less necessary. Let your children need you for the love you show them, not for the skills that you possess, because you want to impart everything you know to them in the best possible way, with the goal being them to be less dependent. Now, let me give you a quick example. My son, when he was young, he said to me, can I go to Jason's house to play? And I said, no. And he said, why not? And I said, because three nights this week out of these four, you've been to Jason's house and you need to give it a rest. And he said, well, Dad, there's no real reason for me not to go to Jason's house to play. And I said, Jim, his name's Jim Jr. I said, you're going to have to trust me on this one. I said, I know when enough is enough. You don't. He said, I don't understand. I said, I totally get that because you're only, you know, a few years old. I said, so you got to trust the fact that I love you and I will make good decisions on your behalf. I'm guiding you wisely. I'm not doing it selfishly to make me feel good. So, you know, no, you can't go to Jason's tonight. He said, well, I don't understand. I said, well, let me put it in a different way. When you were a little baby, if I wanted you to go across the street, I would pick you up in my arms and carry you. And as you got older and you could walk, I realized you had a new skill. So I would let you walk beside me and I would hold your wrist with a death clamp that you could never get away from me to keep you safe as we went across the street. And when you got a little older, I'd say, hold my hand. And now it's you holding me instead of me holding you. And then I said, okay, walk right beside me. And we didn't have to hold hands because you're getting older. You're getting more capable. You're learning more. And then finally, I got to the point where I said, be careful. Look both ways before you cross the street. And then as you develop the ability to make better decisions and the physical ability to do the things that were needed, I could say to you, you could say to me, I'm going out to play. I'd say, fine, be careful, have fun. 
and you had total freedom because you had been through the steps of acquiring the skills for self-reliance. Without that, I would still be carrying you across the street at your current age in your 40s. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. It really shows the, the process of development and learning. And from a business standpoint, when we look at a, a first-line person who's working with a customer, how many times have you gone into a business and you had a problem that you wanted to get solved and someone sold you, I can't do that, I'm not allowed to do that, I can't make that kind of decision. And it just turns you off as a customer. And in other organizations, you see the individual being a problem solver, taking a accountability and responsibility for that customer interaction. You want to hire them away. And exactly. And you want to you want to hire those individuals because they they basically solve the customer's problem and ask for forgiveness later, as opposed yep. to asking permission to begin solving the customer's problem. So yep. this idea of self reliance is in the individual world, as a parent, as a as a business owner, as an employee in the business world, it's needed everywhere. Let's transition now and talk about some of the myths that are so okay. predominant in today's world here. I want to begin with the first one, and, and that is, you know, today's world is very advanced, and because it's so advanced, it's not necessary for you to be that self-reliant because we have other safety nets in place that can really take care of yourself. What's your reaction to that one? Well, that's a victim's rationalization. Say a victim, a person that's totally subjective to and, and dependent on other people, um, they tend to rationalize their situation. Well, you know, what Jim and Ray are talking about is a bunch of hard work. And plus, I don't have permission to do that. And I, I'd get in trouble. And, you know, what if, what if times got tough and uh, all the, you know, there's just their mind is throwing up all these potential obstacles, which is natural for a mind to do. But instead of doing the problem solving when the obstacle comes up, they choose the obstacle as permanent. And so they put it down as part of the fence that becomes a wall between them and what they want to live a, a rewarding and meaningful and free life, okay? And so they're constantly saying, well, no, it's okay. You know, I mean, the, the other people have our back. They've got our best interest in mind. You know, they're not going to come up with rules that are going to hurt us. The, our government's not going to do what governments throughout history have done and intrude into our lives and take away our weapons and, and seize our bank accounts and make us move from here to there and, and stop us from practicing the businesses we're in and dry up our resources and refuse to have a, a pipeline of new supplies coming to us. You know, they're not going to do that. No, they'll never do that. Yeah, so it's a rationalization that victims use to make them momentarily feel better. Right, that's good. Here's the next one. Self-reliant people are isolationists and survivalists. What's your reaction to that one? Actually, it's the other way around. Isolationists and survivalists tend to be self-reliant people, and uh, that's because they have to be. But everybody can become a self-reliant person. You know, it starts in little increments, you know, where you learn to manage your own money or you learn to manage your time better or you learn to manage your own attitude or you learn to manage your emotions so that you're not subject to emotional outbursts based on whatever the stimulus is. The more you learn those little things, the more you take care of your own circumstances, the more self-reliant you become. Now, if you want to be an isolationist, fine, go live with them. You know, a survivalist, okay, go off into the hills and, you know, carry your crossbow and, and paint your face and stuff. That's fine, but that's not what we're recommending. We're right. recommending that the person next door be self-reliant, and you too. And that when a crisis occurs, like a, a tornado hits or an earthquake occurs or, or, you know, some natural disaster, floods or fires or vermin or, you know, name it, that you've got your own act together enough that you don't have to run next door and steal food. You can actually say to someone, hey, let's collaborate. I'll show you what I've got. You show me what you've got, and let's, let's take care of our basic needs, and then we'll go see who else needs help, right? Yep. So self-reliance is about being okay no matter what comes up. It's not about separating yourself from the rest of the world 
and trying to to create some little cult that um, denies the existence of the others. Well said. How about this? This is another myth that um, I think is really interesting. Homeschooling is a radical concept. <laughs> really dig into why people think that it's radical. I'm just going to throw in a couple thoughts on this. Yeah. I think that the, the, the school system has its various pluses and minuses, but one thing is pretty clear. They have your children from a good chunk of the day for a good many years, and what's being said and taught to them or not being taught to them, as the case may be, has a significant impact on their development. So when somebody, as a parent, decides to be self-reliant and take on the responsibility of edu educating their own children, it's not a, it's not a radical concept. It's, it's no, actually it's a primitive concept. It's a, it's a fundamental concept, you know? It's a, I mean, who taught the child how to hold a spoon? Who taught them how to how to be clean and using the bathroom? Who, who taught them what's appropriate to say and not to say, where to go and not to go? You know, I mean, that those are things that homeschooling is universal. All homes have homeschooling. It's just that some of them stop earlier than others in the child's development. And in the United States, we've become accustomed to abdicating our responsibility and saying, okay. The school te public school teachers are now in charge. You know that that got got me thinking. You know when I um would come home from school, uh, throughout all, all the time prior to university, but even through university, it was almost a regular it was a regular habit to discuss what it is that I was being taught, and it was almost like um how should we call yeah. it a, cleans a cleansing process. <laughs> I would learn something in school. Sometimes it was a cementing process that would seat the ideas more firmly in. That true. I, I don't want to make it sound all negative. There was a cleansing component to it and a cementing component to it. Yeah. And the process of discussing what it is that I was being taught and challenging some of those ideas, it really helped reinforce critical thinking in me at, at, an, at an early age. And okay. it also helped to uh, eradicate uh, illogical ideas that was being presented to me as the truth. And being able to understand the difference between the truth and reality. Yeah, and it wouldn't necessarily be something you learn from a teacher. It could be from a classmate. You know, our classmates are the ones that pass along the the, the wrong ideas so often. You know, they, they'd say to us, you know, here's what sex is about, or here's what this is about, or that is about. And and you'd take it as truth. Well, Johnny said so. You know, I no, I know this is so because Johnny said so, and he learned from his big brother. Well, excuse me, but let's filter this through our family and, and see whether it whether it floats, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. So here, let's jump on to an, another, um, another myth, and we can kind of combine a couple of them here. Okay. There's still time to correct it, and I'm going to say, quote, Ray and Jim, you guys are overreacting. Yeah, we're alarmists. We're alarmists, that's right. Woo <laughs> Listen, guys, if, if you're watching this video and you think we're overreacting, I really urge you to take a look at some of the objective statistics that explain and present how the economy is behaving and the, how it has shifted over the last few decades. And really, it's, this has been an ongoing trend for a long time. We oh, didn't yeah. get to where we are today just overnight. And no, it's not our current president's fault or the previous guy's fault. It is a cumulative effect of yes, bad decisions over a period of time. That's for sure. And it, it, just look at what it takes to buy a home today. You know, you consider almost everything we do today that involves the passage of money or authority or, or commitment um, it has a legal dimension to it now. It used to not, right? When I bought my first home, the number of papers I had to sign were, I don't know, a dozen. And today, the stack of papers is, you know, hundreds high. There's even a form. When I bought a house in San Diego, I remember signing a form that said, I claim to be me. That's not <laughs> the way it was worded. But the essence of the form was, I, Jim Cathcart, declare that I claim to be Jim Cathcart. Well, how absurd, how patently insane is that statement? My signature is a claim to be me. Right, mm -hmm. and you know now they're saying, well, you, you know, signature. Oh, you never know. You know, then kids aren't learning cursive writing anymore, and and uh, you know, you make an X or we got to have thumbprints. Uh, give me a break. You know, the process of 
living in this country has become so complex because of the legal fears that we have multiple forms and multiple can't do's that have nothing to do with productivity or getting the right result. They have all to do with, well, you know, so and so or people like so and so might be offended. Well, first off, people like so and so? Let's find actual individuals we're talking about, not clouds of groupings that could exist. And second, offended? When did being offended become such a tragedy? You know, I think getting shot in the face is a big tragedy. I think um, having your house burned to the ground with all your belongings is a big tragedy. I think having somebody diss you is nothing. You know, somebody disrespects me or somebody uh, somebody puts up a cross in their yard and I'm a, uh, uh, I'm a Jew or I'm a Muslim or I'm a, I'm a uh, whateverist, you know. Uh, it, their cross isn't changing my world. It's changing the decorations of it. But for heaven's sakes, there's nobody in my front room saying, you must believe like I believe. They simply put up a cross. Okay, cool. I don't have anything to put up right now, but someday I, I could probably put up something too. You know, now in this case, I'm using that as a, a, a just an illustration. My own personal beliefs are Christian, just so that the viewers know. But I'm not trying to sell them on it. I just think we need less must do and more what works in our world. Well said. Now, as we transition to talk about the blueprint, which I know everybody is eager to, to see, how are we going to deal with these challenges? Yeah. just want to try to bring us in for a landing. What we've been discussing so far is really painting a picture of what has happened in the past, what has happened to what is present today, and how the philosophy of our day, which impacts the politics and the political decisions, the economic re realities and re the, uh, the impacts from an economic standpoint, how that impacts us socially is all shifting and because of this shift we have a much more dependent society as opposed to a self-reliant society, a society which embraces more of the something for nothing mentality as opposed to the something for something mentality where to use an expression, it's like six people are pulling a wagon and six million people are riding it. And <laughs> that that expression, which I, I'm borrowing from, from you, Jim, is really uh, the, the center of causing a major, major problem today and moving forward for our future generations. And unless we wake up to the fact that the answer to this is self-reliance, this domino effect is going to get worse and worse and worse. And some of you out there might be believing that, you know, the United States is so big and strong and can never be unseated as a world power. And, you know, that may or may not be true, but I have to tell you that when we look at some of the, st the statistics from an economic perspective, which is the driving force behind any, any uh, government of the day, it's getting weaker and weaker, and that the only way we can turn this around is through a more self-reliant mindset. Any yes, comment that you have, here, Jim, before we go to the blueprint? Yeah, the the, the whole concept of self-reliance. What we're talking about here is I'm not just talking about you, the viewer, becoming more self-reliant. I'm talking about you and me and Ray and and the rest of the people we know collectively committing to this. I will become more self-reliant, you become more self-reliant, but we will spread the effect so that we can get more and more and more people to be self-reliant. Why is it such a big deal? It's a big deal when it comes to determining the percentage of a society who are self-reliant. A society with 100% self-reliant people can endure almost anything you throw at it. Take an example, the rainforest. A rainforest has so many diverse plants and animals and creatures in it that it can withstand almost anything that hits it. It can withstand every type of disease, drought, insect, name it, and it'll live forever virtually. Okay, that's a rainforest. As opposed to an orchard. An orchard is a rainforest with an oppressive government. Think about it. The government says, the government being the farmer, no more are we going to have ferns. No more are we going to have conifers. We're going to have only fruit trees, okay? And we're going to have a little patch over here for potatoes and other tubers, but we're, that's it. You know, all other plants need not apply. They're not cool anymore, okay? And water will come at the following times per day. 
and if insects come, we're going to attack with a full force of pesticides and wipe them out. So we get to decide what it's going to be, and you guys just sit there and make fruit. Okay? That, that is absolutely a parallel between an oppressive government that's gotten too big and a free society like a rainforest. The rainforest can withstand anything, and everything in it lives by the law of nature. You know, so if you do something against the laws of nature, obviously you're going to end up with consequences. But otherwise, you go through the cycle of life, and everything is recycled. Everything, even waste, is recycled. Okay? So take a look at society, and let's say that the society is not 100% self-reliant people. It's 60% self-reliant people, 40% dependence. Well, that means the 60% who used to get to keep 100% of what they were producing, are now keeping only 60% of what they are producing because the other 40 has to go to support these dependents. Now let's change the society and let's say that these 40% got the, the ability, the legal authority, to unionize and come up with their own rules and, and go against the 60 with whatever laws they wanted to impose on those 60 to make it more fair for the 40. So the 60 end up working harder for less. They end up really resenting all this burden that's put, been put on them unnecessarily and a whole bunch of them cave in and can't handle it and so now then you got sixty percent dependent and forty percent productive and they only get to keep forty percent of their product production because the other sixty percent has to go to take care of these dependent people and next year it's eighty twenty and the next year it's zero to one hundred and everybody's relying on the government. The government said, no, we got it, we got it, we got it. You don't have to be independently productive. We'll just print more money. It's not worth anything, but it will print it, and so you get to use it, and that leads to rampant inflation, and you end up with something like the Weimar Republic back in Germany when one day a loaf of bread costs a dollar, the next day it costs $100,000, next day it costs a million six, next day, forget it, there's no bread anyway. That explains the situation so well. And today, when we talked about this earlier on, we said that today about 100 million people are working, and there's about 215 million that are not for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And if we start to think about the role of our monetary system and how we are expanding it through printing money, as you mentioned, we are doing this to cover an ever-increasing debt because we have so many programs. So, And it's by the way, guys, I'm not uh, going against uh, necessarily... A, a, a programs that for an individual. There's corporate welfare, there's individual welfare, there's welfare for everybody in size and shape and form, and at the end of the day, we can't afford it. And right. one and of the things... The way, that by the way, just to, to address that point, Ray, if you look at society, you know, people say, well, what about the poor people? Look at society. Throughout history, our society, American society, you will find that by a vast majority the private sector, private free individuals working for themselves or working for companies that are not owned by the government, are more generous, more compassionate, more helpful than any agencies, nonprofit agencies that have been, been put in place by the government to try and do the same thing. By far, individuals are more generous than forced generosity that comes through a government program. This conversation, everybody, that we're, we're having right here is not about uh, pushing one group down or pulling one group up. It's about pulling everybody up. I yeah. want everybody to understand that. And the second point I wanted and to highlight... People themselves. themselves. And exactly. And the, the second point I wanted to highlight here is the importance of gold. You know, Jim, 2,000 plus years ago, you could take an ounce of gold and a man could buy a tolga, a belt, and a pair of sandals. Today, the same ounce of gold, nothing changed, can buy a man some kind of a half-decent suit, a belt, and a pair of shoes, because that gold held value. In 1971, one ounce of gold was about 30 bucks. So would you prefer to have that same $30 that you had in 1971 that could buy one ounce of gold, or would you, would you prefer to have that $30 that you can have today? And will it buy you one ounce of gold, or will it maybe, maybe cover a half-decent lunch? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so. and that's not just to sell people on investing in gold. It's the, the reason gold is used as the example is because gold was a constant that had limited supply. There was only so much gold known to exist, and that determined how much money could exist by using gold as the, as the uh, underlying valuation of the currency. Then they took away the gold standard, and it became free-floating based on government policy. Whoa! And now, all of a sudden, we've got a very, very different animal when it comes to money. I mean, a, you know, a car and a horse are still worth a, basically the same amount in actual trade, but when it comes down to reducing it to a monetary equivalent, that's way, way different. And it's affected by so many strange variables. And I'm not trying to give financial advice, but to your point, talking about gold, it's important to realize there's a difference, everyone, between money and currency. Yep. Currency doesn't hold value. Money holds value. And the only way money can hold value is by having a, a, a steady, or I should say a finite amount of quantity. If you can yeah, use currency in your, on your printing press, well, you're not going to hold value. And to Jim's point, you're going to go with a wheelbarrow to buy bread one day in the future if we keep printing more and more money. Yep. And All right. the same could be said for diamonds and, and other things like that, although that's a whole separate discussion. But whatever the underlying thing is, you know, it determines how much equivalent value is available. And, you know, just, just for a little bit of fun here, before we transition to our blueprint, you know, the if you take a look at durables like gold and silver and other things like that, which have been historically used as money, and you talk about it today, you, you can go to al almost any financial advisor. You can talk to almost anybody in the Federal Reserve System, and they will think you are a kook to even talk about this as a way to represent money because we have an advanced society as they tell us and it's not feasible and practical and you know in some ways carrying gold with you might not be so feasible that's why they went to a paper system but it was backed by gold and the yeah. reason for this I just want to finish this one, one comment here the reason for this everybody is because if you tie it to gold you bring together the a notion of accountability and responsibility and you start to go towards a self-reliant society and if you take it away you have a dependent society because you can produce currency yep so what do people do you know that, that, that I, I'm assuming our viewers have said oh, whew, wow you guys are scaring the daylights out of me I'm in I want to become more self-reliant because I realize I don't have to buy a bunch of things from you and Ray in order to do it. I can start doing it right now today in my own home and nobody else is involved and it doesn't use up something else I've got. So how do I, you know, what do I do, right?